Would you please stand? Lord Father, we come before you uh, grateful and thankful of another week that we get to be here in your house and uh, in your presence with your people, Lord. I pray that, uh, that uh, we would be, be uh, open-minded to have our hearts open and our, and our ears open to you this morning that we could hear from you and uh, learn from you and know you better. Lord, help us to worship you this morning in spirit and in truth, and uh, we pray that it would be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 
announcements before Pastor Albert comes up. Let me look at him here. The first announcement is uh, baptisms. If you're a believer in Christ and you would like to be baptized, uh, we're going to be doing that this Saturday, August the 13th at 6 p.m. Uh, the address for the baptism should be right there on the slide. And if you have any more questions, Pastor Albert is the one to ask about that. Also, men's breakfast, um, August 13th, 8 a.m. at Daybreakers in the foothills. Um, there's a, there's a, a book study for men. Uh, the book is 12 Unlikely Heroes by John MacArthur, and uh, that'll be done at September 9th. And if you have any more questions about where or when, Steve, uh, at the back there is the person to ask for that. Pastor Albert. <clears throat> Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Please open your Bibles to 1 John. We are in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 5. If you missed last Sunday, uh, you can always uh, uh, watch uh, the messages on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, or if you have the church app, they are also uh, there as well. Um, while you're getting there, let me just give you a, a quick, um, let me make an announcement actually that I, I forgot to, to add, and that's regarding the, the youth and next Sunday. So the youth are having a swim day. That's going to be at the Yuma Valley Aquatic Center uh, down in the valley here by Avenue C or so. And that's going to be August uh, the 7th from 2 to 6 p.m. So youth parents, uh, jot that down. Bring your, uh, your teenagers um, to that. So with that said, let me go ahead and read what we covered last Sunday, just to give you a reminder of, um, of what direction John is taking uh, his letter here. I'm going to start reading here in verse 1 of 1 John 1, all the way to verse 4, which says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard and declared to, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. And I'll stop there. Father, we do thank you, Lord, uh, because your word is truth. Your word is perfect, Lord. Your word is what we need. And we ask so that at this time that we've set apart during the week to, to listen to your word, that you, Lord, would speak to our hearts, speak into our lives, challenge us, Lord, to be different, to be like your son, Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, uh, to do what you call us to do in your word, what you've already enabled us to do and empowered us to do, Lord. We thank you and we wait upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, John was writing to refute false teachings. Most of our New Testament was written to refute that which is false. So John was writing <clears throat> particularly to a group of um, Gnostics or Gnostic beliefs that were um, gaining ground among believers in the church. And there's various, you know, there's various uh, things that go into Gnosticism. I think a lot of, you know, false religions today, world religions, and, and, and uh, you know, so-called Christian uh, religions um, embrace a form of Gnosticism. If you, could, if you pry a little bit in, in some of the beliefs like uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, and such, there is a bit of Gnosticism in those kinds of things. One of the things that Gnostics, that is believed that Gnostics taught so early in the church, or at least the latter part of the, of the first century here, um, was that Jesus um, was not really God, that, that there was a, a dual nature to, to Christ. I'm even wording it wrong there because they saw Christ as a different entity than Jesus. So they saw Jesus as not born of a virgin, simply a man born of Joseph and Mary. Uh, the, the spirit of Christ, according to them, came upon the man Jesus uh, when he was baptized and enabled him to do all kinds of wondrous works and miracles, and then left him right before he was crucified. Right? And that is a false teaching of Gnosticism. It, it attacks the, the, the biblical person and, and work of Jesus uh, Christ. And this is why 
John writes the way John writes. This is why he, he uses all of his senses, right? He appeals to his senses to say, look, we, we saw him, we heard him, we touched him. And this is who we declare to you. And he, he, he points us back to John 1.1, 1, 1, right? In the beginning was the word, the logos, right? The eternal logos. He has no beginning. He was already there uh, in the beginning and before the beginning with, with God. And so he points to the true nature of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God in, incarnate. And so a lot of the things that, that we're going to read today in verses 5 to 10, he's still trying to address and refute a lot of these, uh, these false teachings. Namely, the, the, the teaching that there is no real sin. All you need to do is be more enlightened. You just need to, be more, you just need to acknowledge that you know, what we do on this earth doesn't really matter. Material things are you know, of no consequence, of no real consequence. We, we can't do any good in our bodies. Therefore, it doesn't matter what we do with our bodies. And that was the kind of, uh, you know, that, that led to a lot of uh, licentious, a lot of um, sinful lifestyles. And saying, well, only the spirit matters. Only the spiritual things matter. What I do with my body doesn't really uh, matter. And so that is Gnosticism at its, uh, at its root here. So let me start by saying this. God is perfect. Uh, God is perfect at everything he does. Everything God does is, is good and perfect. God himself is perfectly good. And God is perfectly omniscient, omnipotent. Uh, you know, uh, God is perfect uh, love. And that's why John, even in this, in this letter, he's, he talks about perfect love. Perfect love casts out fear, right? And so God is everything perfect. Everything that is good, God is perfect. God is perfectly holy. But did you know that God is also perfect light? God is the light, and he is perfect light. Uh, David tells us in Psalm 104:2 that he wraps himself in light. In other words, God is clothed in, in, in this splendor and, and majesty. Can you imagine that? God, God is clothed in, in splendor and, and, and majesty. The Bible also tells us that he dwells in unapproachable light. He dwells in unapproachable light. That means in, uh, something corruptible, something sinful, something that is not perfect cannot enter into God's presence. Hence why, why God in, in the Old Testament, uh, and in the New Testament as well, we call these uh, theophanies and Christophanies where the Lord appears to men uh, through material things, like um, the burning bush, right? The burning bush instead of God's very presence that would destroy uh, Moses on, on the spot. Right? And, so, and so God in the New Testament, he, he comes in the form of a man, in his son Jesus Christ. The word was made flesh, John 1, uh, 14 tells us, and dwelt among us. And Jesus is God. He has no beginning and no end. He dwells in unapproachable light. And we beheld his glory, John tells us in John 1. Notice how James uh, refers to the Father. He says, the Father of light in James 1, 17. Why the Father of light? Well, because light comes from him. Light is synonymous with eternal life here. The father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. That's an interesting uh, phrase. No variation no shadow of turn, or shadow of turning. We have a shadow because we, we revolved. We have a shadow relative to our sun, right? We revolve around the sun. But God created the sun. God created all stars and everything that exists, right? So everything revolves around God. God is pure light. God is pure holiness. Uh, uh, God is pureness perfectly. I, we cannot uh, emphasize that enough. And that's why, you know, as I preach this, I am also trying to worship God by, by declaring these things about him. You can't but worship God when you speak about God because he's just so good and so perfect. So understanding this, let's read verse 5. This is a message which we have heard from him. Him who? Jesus, right? The light of the world. And declare to you that God is what? God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. A double negative, as, as the fancy people call it, right? It, it, God is light, and there is no darkness at all in him. But even the sun, even our sun has dark spots, right? It, the, the, the sun is not perfect light. There's, perfect, there's dark spots in, 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 our, in our sun. But God doesn't, doesn't need the darkness to be light. God is self-sufficient. He exists forever. The darkness uh, exists in the absence of light. And so, in light of that, no pun intended, God 
can and only does good. God only does good. Why? Because he can't do anything but good. Why? Because there's no darkness in him at all. And that, that might sound like a simple, you know, Sunday school kind of, you know, uh, truth. But it, I think it's profound if you really dig deep into what it means that God is light and that God, there is no darkness in God, that God is perfectly good. You know, in the context of James, uh, what is it, James 1.17, he's appealing to the nature of God in giving here and saying every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And so the, the, the previous sentence there points to the fact that God gives good gifts. God gives perfect things to his people. Well, Albert, what about when I go through bad stuff? I thought God was good, right? I think one of the, one of the main things that, that we hear from, from unbelievers and, and, you know, from believers who maybe just lack some knowledge in, in, in the truth of God is, you know, why does God allow evil, right? Well, God allows evil because he allows us to exist because we are evil. We're not good. It, 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 God was loving and allowing and not destroying Adam and Eve right away as soon as they disobeyed him. Yet, he said, the day that you eat of it, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. So a good and perfect God speaks that good and perfect truth to a, a people who had not yet sinned. And then they chose to sin out of their own free will. They chose to sin and God showed them mercy. But, in God, but God showing mercy does not mean that he allowed them to abide with him in sin. He had to evict them from the garden. Why? Because sin separates us from a holy God. And so he evicts them, right? And there, even though the text doesn't get into the details of the first animal sacrifice, we see that God clothed Adam and Eve with animal skin. Right? So something had to die in order to cover their nakedness, their, their, their sin. Some people speculate, and this is neither here nor there, but I'll mention it. Before sin, some believe that Adam and Eve were clothed also in some form of light where they, they didn't see or really recognize their, 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 their nakedness. Maybe, I mean, they were, you know, uh, without sin, or maybe they were in a, in a glorified uh, body, so um, that could be the case, but it's interesting. Yet, the bigger point is this, God only the, does good because there is no darkness in him. What about when bad stuff happens? Well, when bad, bad quote-unquote, bad stuff happens, God remains good, right? Uh, when he allows calamity in the world, God remains good. When he sends the wicked to eternal hell, God remains good. When the bold judgment and revelation and the tribulation that we read about uh, comes about, God is still good. Why? Because we, we don't define good. We don't. God defines good. Only good can define that which is not. Only God can define that which is not good in, in his sight. And we have God's word to tell us what is good and what is not. And so we cannot appeal to our own logic or our own reason. If God says something is evil and wrong, then we believe it. We trust it and we obey him. Today the world appeals to God. The unbelieving world appeals to God without knowing it. But they have no, no foundation to say something is wrong or right. They just say, well, they're not hurting anybody, so they're good. Just leave them to themselves, right? That's usually the, the, the things that people say. But God is the one who decides what is good. The atheist, for example, cannot appeal, not, not logically, the atheist or the agnostic cannot logically appeal to, to, to some moral standard because there is no standard under random chance. To them, the reality is you, you're, you're just stardust. You're just fizzing right now, right? And so the, the, the worst of us, uh, Hitler, Stalin, and you know, mass murderers, rapists, and all that, they're just fizzing a little bit more than the rest of most people, right? But see that there's no, there's no real reason to say, well, that's evil or, or that's bad and this is good over here. There's no real standard. God is the standard. And that's why we as Christians, we, we appeal to God's word. We appeal to what he says because he's good, he's perfect, and he tells us what is not good and what is not perfect. Goodness comes from God's presence. That's our next point. Goodness comes from God's presence. So it doesn't matter if, you know, I mean, sin often comes disguised as pretty, right? Sin often looks pretty. Sin can be moral. Sin can be even uh, have a sense of kindness. But if God says something is evil innately, then it is evil because God says it. Goodness comes from God's presence. 
Others ask, why doesn't God deal with bad people now? Why doesn't God just wipe out all the mass murderers, all the school shooters, child molesters, right? All the, you know, the, the list of the worst of the worst as we would define them. Why doesn't God do that? Well, because God, here it is, because God is a perfect God. God is a perfect judge. And if God, listen, if God were to judge those we deem as the most sinful, he would also, because he is a perfect God and there's no darkness in him, he would also judge the liar, right? The petty thief, right? As we would define them, the petty thief, to God, sin is sin. To God, if it's not perfect, it's still in the same cat. It's still in darkness. Does that make sense? And this is why the gospel is so important to understand. This is why Jesus needed to be sinless and perfect. Why his sacrifice needed to be perfect. Why, why, why at the cross it is finished and not help wanted. Because only he can provide the sacrifice that was necessary to atone for the sins of humanity. Whether you were a moral unbeliever or the worst of the worst outside of Jesus, the blood of Jesus Christ pays for, for all that. God is light and in him is no uh, darkness uh, at all. You see, to God, darkness is darkness, whether it's a little or a lot. Darkness is darkness, whether it's a little or a lot to God. And that's so important to, to know and understand. God does, not un God does not dwell in a gray area. He is perfect uh, light, and he will only accept into his presence what is perfect. That's why you and I, we, we fellowship with God. Remember last week, we fellowship with God, but it's not in and of ourselves. We fellowship with God through God's Son. It is through the, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. But Jesus also said of himself that he was the light. And so in Jesus Christ, we are sons of the light and therefore can have fellowship with a holy and perfect God. Psalm 51.4, David says against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. You see, David prayed this prayer, said these words after he had messed up pretty bad, right? He committed adultery. He uh, committed murder, technically murder, even though he didn't get his own hands dirty. He, he facilitated the murder of another. And so David, and David, the man after God's own heart, David, the man who defeated the giant, could not defeat his own lust when it happened. And he, he, he played those things out. He let things play out, and we see what happens when we, let, when we play with sin, right? We see the consequences of sin in our life. And yet, God is a good God. He's a merciful God. And, and David comes to the Lord. Psalm 51, if you haven't read it, I encourage you to read it. He comes to the Lord broken, repentant, and the Lord forgives him outside of the law. Because did you know that in the law, because this is the old covenant, in the law there was no covering for that kind of sin. There was no covering for murder. The, the, the result of adultery was being stoned to death. The law communicates the perfect justice and holiness of God, the demand, right? And so David found mercy in a time where, under the law at least, there wasn't, it was, mercy wasn't communicated, but only death. Yet he found mercy, he found God's forgiveness because he was broken and he was contrite. To God, darkness is darkness, whether it's a little or, or a lot. And so one thing we must understand is that, you know, we're sinners. We are sinners in need uh, of a Savior, and that is essential um, to get to a point of uh, receiving Jesus. How can you receive the lifesaver if you fail to acknowledge that you're drowning, right? How can we receive something that we fail to recognize? And I mentioned that because that was something the Gnostics did. They, they saw the body as of, of no consequence. They saw themselves as, you know, like maybe um, some see, you know, like, like the Sikhs, the Hindus and the Buddhists, they just see themselves as... I just need a higher form of enlightenment, enlightenment, and that's why they needed to know that they were sinners. Now, going back to this, this theme of God being good and still allowing us to go through suffering, well, if God is perfectly good in all His ways, then that means He's perfectly omniscient. So He knows the beginning and the end. He's already watched the movie, if you will. And so if God allows, if God permits some, some discomfort in our life, some difficulty, some death, some abuse, whatever it may be, God sees beyond that, right? God sees the, the outcome of, of the difficulty. 
in, in Genesis chapter 50, I believe, Genesis 50, 19 and 20, we see Joseph who had already gone through a lot. His own brothers threw him in a hole, sold him as a slave. He went through a lot of suffering for a lot of years. He was a servant, but he was a faithful servant. God was with him. And then towards the end, when God had already elevated him to be second in command, only second to, to Pharaoh, he revealed himself to his brothers. And his brothers were scared, right? Because they, they knew they had messed up. And Joseph tells him, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. And that's the idea. God can be, can be sovereign. God can be omniscient. And, and the evil that he allows in our life, in one sense, is still good because God sees the, the best uh, beyond it. And that's how we grow, right? Some people grow. I mean, I, I should correct that. All believers grow through difficulty. And that's why God allows a difficulty so we can go uh, through it. Because he sees something better beyond it. <clears throat> and if God is light, we must walk in the light. This is why John tells them about God's nature. So they can do something about it. So they can examine themselves. He says in verse 6, if we say, it's a profession. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we, live, we lie and do not practice the truth. I love this about John because he's, just, he's, he's very blunt, right? You're a liar if you say that you have fellowship with God. And this is not coffee and donuts with God. This is you are saved. You are in the light through the sun, right? You do not have fellowship with God if your body contradicts your profession. Notice if we say that, that's, that, that's uh, something verbal, right? But then when you w get to walking, that's activity. That's a lifestyle. It's not simply falling into sin here and there. We do that as believers, by the way but it's living in sin. We, and do not practice the truth, he says. We lie. Verse 7, But if we walk in the light as God is in the light, he, we have fellowship with one another. And remember, there is no darkness in God, right? So it's not a gray area. God doesn't give us gray areas to, to walk in. God says, here's, here's what's right, here's what's wrong. Walk in what is right. Walk in my ways. Walk in my word. We have fellowship with one another, he says. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And what that means is essentially what he said, what we read last week that John says, right? If we have fellowship with the Father, we have fellowship with one another. Why? Because we are children of God. And in, in that fellowship is different than having acquaintances and friends outside of Jesus, right? What does Paul say in Corinthians about not being unequally yoked with unbelievers? There in that paragraph or that sentence, he says, what fellowship, what, what fellowship do, does light have with darkness? The implied answer is none, right? What fellowship do believers have with unbelievers? None. And so while we can be kind, while we can show God's love and God's mercy, we have to be careful with how much we interact with the unbeliever because the unbeliever can pull us from walking in the light, from being in, you know, uninterrupted fellowship with the Lord. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But here's our point. If the truth is not our practice, we are still in darkness. That's the, the, the bluntness of, of what John just says here in verses, uh, what is it, 6 and 7, right? If our practice, excuse me, if the truth is not our practice, we are still in darkness. If our activity is not in line with our identity, we're liars, is what he's saying, right? Because so often, and I hope no one here, but chances are there are always going to be some here, right? In the hearing of the word, in the, in the physical building, who profess one thing, but who deny their profession, profession by the things that they do. And that's why it's so important we read the word and we examine our hearts. Because where the heart is at, the body follows. The evidence of a changed heart is going to be a changed life. I can't say, well, I love my wife and kids, but I do not care for my wife and kids. I, I show no physical evidence that I actually love them. You would say I am a liar, right? If I deserted my family, but I said, well, I hold them dear and near to my heart, right? That would be a false uh, profession. And many, many do it today. There are a lot of false professions, a lot of denials of the Lord. It's just saying, not displaying. But our Lord says in John 18, 12, I am the light of the world. 
He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. Why? Because that's an inconsistency. But have the light of life. And that, that speaks of possession, right? If you have the light, then you will uh, walk in the light. And just like darkness and light cannot abide in, in the same immediate presence at the same time together, neither can we abide in the light and darkness at the same time. There is no gray. We're either doing one or the other. As Jesus says, we either love one or hate uh, the other. But he, Paul makes it even more precise in Ephesians 5.8. For you were once darkness. Notice how he doesn't say in the darkness, right? He says you were the darkness. You were once darkness. That was your previous identity, my previous identity. But now you are light in the Lord. Emphasis in the Lord, right? Outside of the Lord it's, is darkness, but in the Lord is light without darkness. And so you and I, we have to live in the now. We have to live in the Lord and walk as children of light, as the offspring of, uh, of God's light in our life, God's eternal life, that is. Again, if the truth is not our practice, then we are still in darkness. And so, as believers, we have to have this fellowship together, right? A fellowship that is consistent with the fellowship that we now have with the Father uh, in heaven. The Bible says we are seated in the heaven, heavenly places. And so, as we walk together, as we, as we love one another, as Jesus said, as we serve one another, we, we must strive to have, be of one mind in Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul talks about the fulfillment of the law as we love one another. And so that's what, that, I think that there's a sense to that in what he says here at the end of verse 7 as well. But I'll talk more about that towards the end of the message. Back to what these Gnostics taught. This is important before we read, what is it? Before we read verse 8. They taught, hey, you know what? I'm not really a sinner. What I do in the body doesn't matter. And you know, some people are like that, and it's hard to be around them because they don't take responsibility for their actions, right? It's hard to be, to fellowship uh, with people who, who fail to recognize that they have done wrong. Even as believers, we have to recognize when, when, when we sin, we have to confess it, repent of it. If we wrong a brother or a neighbor, an unbeliever, we have to show them that, you know what, we're just beggars pointing other beggars to where, you know, the bread of life is at. And so we, we humble ourselves and we, we, we seek reconciliation uh, with, other, with others. But often, or at least here at this time, a lot of these people were embracing false teachings uh, like that of, of, you know, I'm not really a sinner. Even as a believer, we can say, well, that's the old me, right? That's the old Albert. You know, I'm, I'm a new creation. Therefore, well, I don't really, you know, what I do now is not, not that bad. Be careful with that. That's why John says in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We're, we're self-deceived people. And the truth is not in us. That we don't have the truth. If we uh, live this self-deceptive lie where we fail to acknowledge that. Uh, that, that we're sinners. And so as believers, to, to be a believer, you need to acknowledge your sin. But as believers as well, we have to acknowledge as well that we live in a body that is prone to sin. Right? A body that, that is tempted and it has uh, natural inclinations to do that which God does not see as good or, or as holy. This is why John follows it with, in, with verse 9 where he says, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. He again restates his main point. But now, earlier he says, we're, we are liars if we say we are in the light, but we deny that by walking in darkness, right? But now he says, now we make God a liar when we say we don't have sin. Why? Because God's word tells us that we are sinners. God's word reveals to us, make it, makes it uh, with certainty that we are fallen sinners and we need God's grace to be saved. We need Jesus. Jesus came to save sinners. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I love that about Paul. He's like, I'm, and I'm the worst of them, right? Jesus came to save sinners, and I'm the worst of sinners. And that's profound to me because he's saying that in light. He's, he's putting himself at, um, I don't know what that fabric is called, 
But maybe when you got your wife uh, a diamond ring, if, if she has a diamond ring, um, uh, when you, you know, gave her the, the, the engagement rings and all that, it, it came in a little black box, right? It's a nice little leather, or not leather, but, you know, velvet. Thank you. Well, we, we and our sin is, are, are that velvet. God's grace is that diamond. The diamond has the same amount of value whether it's in front of the velvet or away from the velvet. But when we, you put it together, you see the great, our sin is greater as we see God's, God's love or God's grace, right? And that's why I think Paul says, I am the chief of sinners. Jesus came to save sinners. See, we must acknowledge our sin to receive from him. You must acknowledge your sin to receive from him. And this can be a little bit difficult when you're trying to evangelize, you know, a Buddhist or a Hindu. Maybe, maybe you don't have any relationships with uh, people like that. Uh, but maybe you will encounter some people like that. I know there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of people who embrace that form of Gnosticism that wouldn't necessarily identify with the former religion, tie themselves to some former religion, right? But we can show people through God's word that we are sinners in need of God's saving. Now, let's go back here a little bit, right here to verse 9, with the word confess. The word confess uh, literally means to agree with. When we confess, we acknowledge that we are sinners. We, we, we uh, fall in line with God's declaration of us, that we are sinners. And often the word confess is rendered acknowledge in, 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 in our Bibles. Uh, Jesus, for example, says, um, whoever confesses me before men or acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge or confess before my Father in heaven. But then notice the opposite of that. The ne very next line, Jesus says, but whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father in heaven. So you have acknowledgement or confession and denial, right? And these seem to be absolutes. These seem to be darkness and light. So the, obviously the person that denies Jesus that he, in this life, I think there's still hope if you're still breathing. But if you deny Jesus, the Lord will deny you, obviously, because you failed to recognize, to acknowledge, to confess him. And I think that's, that's the heart of what uh, John is trying to tell us here. We have to acknowledge the Lord. We have to acknowledge that he's Savior. That's why Romans, uh, what is it, Romans 10, 9 and 10? We must confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. We have to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, and we will be saved, the Bible says. And that's why I say we must acknowledge our sin to receive from him. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about cultiv cultivating humility as Christians. There are a lot of Christian writers today, like A.W. Tozer, maybe. He, he's one of those as well. I think Spurgeon does it as well, um, you know, who focus on the holiness of God. Paul Washer. You know, just the holiness of God and, and, and you know, the fact that God is good and, and how His goodness demands for us to walk in the light, to live in the light, to not compromise or walk with, with, uh, with darkness, right? And so listening, reading our Bibles, listening to those who, who are encouraging us to live in light of that, I think we will keep short accounts with God. We will be like the tax collector who comes to the temple. Remember that guy? He comes, uh, it's two guys, and Jesus says, Actually, the Bible tells us that the, the Lord says this in front of people who trusted in themselves, self-righteous people. And the Lord is like, okay, so there was a, a Pharisee and a tax collector. The Pharisee comes into the temple, he's praying, and he's saying, Lord, he's boasting about how good he is. He's like, Lord, you know, I'm glad I'm not like this guy over here. I'm not a murderer and this and that. I give a tithe of all my possessions. And then the Lord talks about the tax collector, and that guy was humble. That guy was broken and repentant. But notice what he says here in uh, Luke 18. And the tax collector, standing afar off, he wouldn't even get close because he, he felt the greatness of his sin, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me of what? A sinner, right? He acknowledged... He, he acknowledged, he, he said what God believed about him already, what, God, what was true about him already. And that's what confession is. We simply fall in line with what God's word has already said about uh, all of us. What does the next line say? Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. He was declared righteous rather than the other. Why? Because one boasted in his self-righteousness. And the other one acknowledged, he confessed that he was a sinner and he needed God's grace and God justifies uh, that man.
And that's why I say we must acknowledge our sin in order to receive from him. Now, I mentioned earlier that I would leave the last part of verse 7 to the end of our message. So let's do that now. In verse 7, at the end it says, And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, that statement is in the present act, active indicative. And I know most of that, really, what, what does that matter to me, Albert? So let me simplify it. That, that's talking about a continual cleansing. You and I as believers, we not only have uh, God's initial cleansing, we're, we're not, you know, when we're saved, when we're justified. We read in Titus, right, at the end of Titus, that we've been uh, regenerated. That means to be born again. We've been made new. We've been justified, the Bible says. So we have all those things. We have God's grace. We are saved. But God, where sin abounds, grace superabounds. So we have God's continued grace in our lives. And this, this part sort of speaks into the intercessory work of Jesus Christ presently. God intercedes for his, his own. This speaks about also, I think it overlaps sanctification as well, because the word here is, uh, is cleansing as well. It talks about cleansing. And so we, we are cleansed as we, as we keep short accounts with God, as we continue to confess our sins to the Lord. I was telling first service that I unintentionally make it my habit to ask God to forgive me of my sins every time I ask God, uh, every time I thank God for the food that I'm about to eat. I think it's a, it's a good habit. Not that we should say prayers that are disconnected from, you know, how we really feel, but I think it's a good, a, a godly habit to keep short accounts with God to acknowledge that even though the Lord has forgiven us of our sin, that in this body, we still mess up. And we, we want unhindered fellowship uh, with God um, as we remain in this body. Because the reality is that the Lord has made us new. He's changed the software, but we're still waiting for the new hardware, right? We're still waiting for that new body. For that new body where, where there is no disease, no sickness, or we will not have the, the, the inclinations to sin and all that kind of stuff. We're, we're still waiting for that. But in the meantime, we have the blood of Jesus Christ who continues to wash us in you, to remove any, any, any uh, it's like when Jesus says, you know, you are already washed or, or bathed, right? When he tells his disciples, you just need your feet to be washed or cleaned. It's the same idea. We need to keep short accounts with God. How do we do that? I said already confession, but also walking in the light, Staying in the word, obeying Jesus. Jesus says, abide in me and I will abide in you. Let me say this. We are cleansed continually because we are saved eternally. Being cleansed continually is a byproduct of the fact that we already are saved. And that's something to understand. Because somebody can easily say, well, Albert, we're being saved. We're, we're still you know, being saved in the sense that we, we're keeping ourselves saved. There is no real assurance of salvation. So, so you have to continue to, 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 to be saved by, by tapping into different graces here and there. And hopefully, you'll make it. That's not what my Bible tells me. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Okay? You see, there's a difference between our sin in the darkness and our sin in the light. You have judicial forgiveness, that is, the forgiveness of a criminal, of a wrongdoer. And that happens, one, when you trusted in Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ was applied to you. So you were forgiven of all your sins. But in Jesus, we still sin. If you don't think you sin, go back to verse 8, right? And read what he says there. But in Jesus, we have parental forgiveness. Parental, judicial. And parental is continual. Now, when we sin, we sin as children of God. I love my son, I love my daughters, I love my children. When they, you know, when they mess up, I'm not going to kick them out of the house. I'm not going to say, well, you're no longer my child. If we're good parents, when our kids misbehave, do disobey our word, right? Uh, uh, challenge us, test our, our word. If we're good parents, we are going to bring a consequence. We will back up our word because we love them, Proverbs tells us. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Well, God is a perfect God. He's a good God. And so when we, his children, sin, there are consequences in, of our sin. And it, this is what happens. If we linger, if we linger in coming to God for forgiveness, 
If we linger in a certain sin, pornography, uh, uh, lustful thought, thinking things that are wrong, uh, uh, saying things that are wrong, doing things that are wrong, that's all sin. If we fester in those kinds of things, then you know what? Eventually, the consequence comes. That's why David, even though David was forgiven, he still lost his child. David went through so much after that with his adult children as well. All kinds of stuff happened as well. And that's how it is. You know, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, the Bible says. So often as believers, we're going to sin. And God is going to forgive us because God's grace, the blood of Christ is there and continues to wash us anew. But we cannot escape from a lot of the consequences of this earthly life. And that's what, that's, you know, we see the discipline of the Lord there in those things. Let me show you this uh, picture here, uh, this analogy with, with horses. Maybe the right word is illustration. Well, before we were over here, we were dead in sin before Jesus, right? We were in the darkness. The horse here is a picture, let's say it's our flesh, right? We were moving, but we were stillborn. We were not spiritually alive, so we're just going about our business. Only, the only thing that ruled was the flesh. But now in Jesus Christ, we can either live in victory over sin by confessing it, by keeping short accounts with God, obeying Him, or we can play with sin. And what happens when you play with sin? You get hurt, you get dirty, right? And that's what happens. So your choice, you have, if you're in Jesus, you have one of two choices. You can continue to live in victory over sin, or you can play with sin and see what happens. And we know what happens. We know how the story uh, ends. And that's why Paul says things like in 1 Corinthians 11, there were those uh, in the church who were being unloving, who were not loving fellowship with one another as they should. They were in sin, unrepentant sin, I might add. And he says, that's why some of you are, are dead. Some of you are asleep, sick and asleep, i.e. dead and dying. And so not all sickness, I'm not saying all sickness is a result of personal unconfessed sin, but some is a, dis God will allow that to discipline us, to bring us to repentance, to bring us to a place of unhindered fellowship uh, with the Lord. And like I was saying earlier, if you're a good parent, your kid messes up, and you go to Dairy Queen, that kid is not going to get ice cream. If you, if, you give, if you reward their bad behavior, you're not being a good parent right now. But God is a good parent, and so often we are going to lose rewards. There is no loss of salvation. There is loss of rewards for the believer. You can check that out in Corinthians as well. And so that's what we can expect. Re loss of eternal rewards, earthly chastening of the Lord, whether it's through sickness or through different difficulties. Um, that's what happens when we allow sin to take the lead in our lives instead of being victorious over it. So let me close with this passage and then we'll pray. I think Colossians 2, 13 and 14 really summarize to some extent and point out the obvious. Paul says, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Note, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And that is, that, that is the, the, the gospel that we believe, that is the hope that we have, that is uh, what we trust. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, because you canceled that sin debt. But your grace abounds, Lord, to, to where we continue to have your grace so we can continue to have unhindered fellowship with you in, in this body of flesh. And so we ask, Lord, that you would help us to be faithful, to not play with sin, to not continue to think wrong, say wrong, or do wrong. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand.